Where are you fishing at? Hmm. Says Steel City Bullies. Well, Tuck, where are you fishing at? Um, I am fishing mostly in Beaufort, South Carolina, to answer that question, uh, which is for, the, you know, for reference for a lot of people very close to Hilton Head, not too far south from Charleston, hour and a half south of Charleston um, as car drives. And uh, pretty much as far south as we can be and still be on the coast of South Carolina. Ed's here from Florida. Ed's a, Ed's a regular regular on our fly tying. Hi, oh, Ed. How are you doing? And Bill? Bill's, Bill, where are you from? Yeah, Bill, I feel like I know that name. And Karsten's here. Karsten, where are you from? Ooh, Bill's Minnesota. from Minnesota. Isn't that where that isn't that where that guy had that flat spot? And Roger Bird. <laughs> hey Roger. How you doing, Roger? <clears throat> Roger Bird, I I do not believe has missed a single one of my live streams, fly tying and otherwise. Wow. I don't, I don't think Roger has missed a single one. And I actually, actually got to meet Roger. I was out at an um, uh, uh, event in Texas and got to meet Roger. And Roger has been uh, asking questions on the, uh, the podcast for years. So Roger and Irma are good buddies. So I want to know if, uh, if the Dan and Rose, if he loves your shirt, Tom, or if he loves mine. I won't go with I yours. <laughs> I don't see some someone who oh loves the shirt. Yeah. That's gotta I'm, be I'm, mine. Gotta be yours. Yeah. Yeah. If you want one, backcountry hunters and anglers. Great organization out of uh, cool. Missoula, Montana. Uh, they're they're helping us uh, preserve uh, access to our public lands for both fishing and hunting and, oh. and otherwise and hiking. Good luck with the reds this weekend. Oh yeah. I know. Uh, I know David. <laughs> I can guarantee David's drinking some good wine right now. Cause that's his business. Ah, mm -hmm. David, you could share it with us. Yeah. All right, so it's after eight. Let's okay. start the official presentation, cool. Tuck. Um, I'm Tom Rosenbauer from Orvis, and my uh, guest today, or the star of the show, actually, is Tuck Scott from Bay Street, uh, Outf Bay Street Outfitters. That's right. Bay Street Outfitters in Beaufort. Did I say Bu it right? Beaufort. Buford. Buford. <laughs> yeah, you were somewhere in between Beaufort and Buford. That was a good safe way to do it, Tom. Uh, South Carolina. And Tuck's a, Tuck's a, a very, very experienced guy. He's been around a long time, done a lot of teaching. Um, one of the most popular saltwater guides in the country. And so um, Tuck's going to share his ideas on, you know, answering your questions and, and just helping you get started in this crazy, addictive uh, saltwater fly fishing world. All right, cool. Um, and I'm going to trust in, uh, I'm going to trust in Tom to help me with any questions here. Um, so, you know, we've got a little bit of an outline, but I would rather if, if questions pop up that we need to answer, I think that's probably as much or more important. So, um, so in any case, um, yes, I'm Tuck Scott. I'm in Beaufort, South Carolina. I'm the head guide for Bay Street Outfitters here. Um, we are, like I said earlier, I most probably missed it because it was a little before time, but um, we are real close to Hilton Head. We're about as far south in South Carolina as you can be on the coast, uh, about an hour, 15 hour and 30 from Charleston due south. So, um, and 
I also have a separate little company where I do a fair amount of saltwater fly fishing education called Building Anglers. Um, I'll probably say this more than once just so people get it. But uh, in terms of following everything that I do down here fishing wise, you can do that through Bay Street Outfitters social media or me specifically. You can do it through Building Anglers uh, on Instagram and Facebook. So um, the in terms of kind of the things that we do here and um, we're going to try to get a broader spectrum of any saltwater fish but um but we mainly fish for redfish here uh, we also fish for speckled sea trout flounder ladyfish triple tail uh cobia is going on right now i saw somebody wrote that earlier uh oh duncan elkins uh, i know him as well um he's referring to uh the question he wrote is referring to a nice 50 plus pound cobia that uh, a client of mine put on a couple days ago um and uh we also have some tarpon that show up but putting them on the fly is less reliable for sure so um and i uh I kind of got started here as a, I was probably three or four when my grandparents built a uh, family vacation house down here um, that I grew up coming to, you know, pretty religiously long weekend, spring break, Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, and, and pretty much all summer. So uh, I spent a lot of time on these waters as a child, uh, probably more back then, filling the freezer and uh, nowadays much more not filling the freezer and putting everything back. So um, um, in terms of the kinds of things we do here that translate really to all salt water, um, we, you know, in terms of saltwater fly fishing, I think a lot of times most of the photos we see and the, uh, the fishing we expect to have would be from a flats boat. Um, but obviously there's a fair amount of wade fishing that goes on in this sport as well. Um, we are fortunate to have that here in, in the low country, but, um, but, uh, but, and while it's very different from what you would expect of a wading situation in some place like the Bahamas or, um, or Belize or someplace like that, um, we wear the same kind of boots. We wear the, uh, we expect to be able to find um, it's good sight casting opportunities on foot in a good many places uh, throughout our saltwater environments. I spend most of my time fishing from a Maverick uh, 17 HPXS carbon edition. Um, and, and that gives me the ability to be in some super skinny areas that let me, um, that let me fish uh, pretty much all of the sight casting fish, whether it would be wading for most people in other boats or or a little bit deeper where we're fishing mud flats and things like that. Um, but but it's the kind of thing where a lot of saltwater stuff in a, in a lot of areas can be accessible to people that don't have boats so long as they know where they can and cannot wade. Um, and and our area is no exception on that. We have throughout the low country and other, you know, marsh grass areas. I would kind of uh, talk about that probably being from somewhere in North Carolina uh, all the way down, maybe just a little south of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, we have these good marsh areas. Um, we're very fortunate here in Buford itself to have 25% of the entire United States East Coast marshland water at our uh in our backyard all inside beaufort county so um but that grass um there's different types of that marsh grass or different links that grow in different areas so we're able to do a most of our wade fishing here has got to be during flood tides where we can get up in that grass whereas if you travel someplace like the bahamas or belize um then or other places like that cuba places like that there's going to be a lot more uh, waiting to be done over sand flats. Um, and I'm going to trust in Tom to talk at some point here a little bit about some striper uh, fishing on the fly, which I know really next to nothing about. Um, so he's going to hopefully give us a little bit more understanding on that than I'll be able to uh, when we talk about some different species. Um, and then obviously there's other things in terms of 
not just the traditional flats boat stuff, not just the traditional wade fishing, but, um, but there's things that go on where you could be fishing under bait balls and more open water and throw, um, sinking lines and, um, and, and have those areas of more open ocean or big water, uh, that is less sight casting, um, but still fly fishing or even some fly fishing in salt water where things are, are teased up and then we can, you know, we're throwing behind a boat, uh, in terms of those, uh, teased up fish as well. Um, so that kind of covers the broad spectrum. Again, most of it, the fishing that we do in a lot of our saltwater environment involves these little technical skiffs that are pulled um, over over the the flats, whether it be flats that could be weighted or whether it could be more traditional mud flats and things like that. So, um, so in terms of kind of my area, I want to talk more about kind of the southeast and and especially the low country. Um, our redfish fishing um, is a is predominantly a sight casting game. Uh, that's probably the most of what we do in salt water. I would say more often than not is a sight casting game. So the the types of things we do here in looking for fish. Um, I'll jump uh, ahead real quick to one thing that we have uh, in kind of the equipment list of things. I can't tell you how invaluable good polarized sunglasses are to what we do in most all of our saltwater environments. Um, it, it, it is a requirement to be able to help us see these fish. Um, not everything happens under the water, but a lot of things in terms of visibility for these fish in salt water do happen underwater. And so having a uh, situation to be able to see these fish um, using, using sunglasses, good polarized sunglasses, generally amber or uh, vermilion, maybe even yellow uh, uh, lens colors will help. I'm going to talk later on some more about that. but. Um, but in terms of that sight casting, we are often looking for shadows of fish under the water. Sometimes we're fortunate enough with a redfish here to be able to look for um, the coppery orange kind of color, um, as well as maybe a tail, maybe a back from a fish. Um, the movement of water is very important to be able to see these things. Um, and, and so that sight casting game is is really important and kind of the different things we do uh throughout most all of our saltwater environments it can be very different if i go to some place like the bahamas it takes my eyes a little bit to get trained to how how we look for those you would think it'd be so much easier just to go and look for those bonefish down in that clean clear water with that white background versus here we've got some dirty often kind of off color water and that's just what you're used to, but uh, you stay with it and you start kind of getting, you know, seeing things that you didn't see the first day. Um, but you end up seeing the second or the third day as you go through the day. Um, and then in terms of other things, in terms of the tailing, um, whether it's redfish here uh, or bonefish, obviously something sticking up out of the water like that makes things much easier um, to be able to, uh, to be able to see and, and get, get a shot at, um, and, and things even, you know, here we're fortunate enough to have this grass around those tailing fish. A lot of times that grass will give up the fish in terms of the, seeing the movement and twitches of the grass. Um, in terms of sight casting, Tom, for, for striper and stuff, is that, uh, is that more, is that much of a sight casting game or are you going off signals of birds and things like that more well it's everything talk um you know you can fish for them offshore in the rips where they're eating squid and sand deals you can fish for them in, in the uh, estuaries where they're again popping bait fish and then there are certain places where there's flats uh where the fish will come up into shallow water but these are these are pretty much wide open flats more like bahamas style um no weed uh just white sand hard white sanding weighted barefoot 
and um, you know you're just looking for fish or shadows of fish. Sure. Okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna talk. Uh, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. We'll come back to that sight casting stuff because it's so <coughs> it's so important in what we do. But uh, just real quick on in terms of gear in salt water, um, I'm gonna head there for a minute and and kind of talk about common weights. I mean, we can get we could make this whole podcast about not just gear. We could make it about uh, about fly line. <laughs> Uh, there's so many different and, and it can become very intimidating. I mean, to my right here, I've got in the, in the outfitter here, I have multiple line weights and, and species specific and sinking intermediate floating, all that. And we'll try to kind of break some things down for if you are, if you're planning to go on a saltwater trip, um, the kinds of things you would want to think about having as an angler in those situations. I'm also going to talk real quick too in there about depending on where you go, just how serious you want to take uh, having that equipment. Um, as oh, a, by course, the way, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, talk, but by the way, if you have questions, just uh, put them in the chat. Um, you know, Tuck and I will try to answer them for you, probably mostly Tuck, but uh, if you have any questions at all as we go, just fire them into the chat. Um, that's the beauty of doing this live is that you're able to ask questions while you're here. So don't be shy about asking questions. Cool. Yeah, please do. Please do. It actually probably makes our job easier the more questions you ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, in terms of most saltwater environments or a lot of saltwater environments, you know, an, an eight or a nine weight um, is is the probably most universal rod. Um, I used to see more. Uh, I used to see kind of more nine weights years and years ago, but with today's um, with today's technologies and rods, I think in some ways we can be slightly. Um, we can be slightly lower in our rod category or weight category than we could be, uh, you know, before. So um, I see this question from Sawyer Brooks about a good redfish fly. I, well, I promise you we are going to get to, I've got a bunch of flies sitting right here. Um, it is, it is something we are definitely going to get to with a, quite a few good, uh, good redfish flies. Um, so from a, uh, general purpose rod, most of the time, I tell people in our neck of the woods that an eight weight is probably the, the most versatile rod. We can fish for redfish, ladyfish, speckled sea trout, um, all with a, uh, all with an eight weight. We can fish triple tail, things like that. Um, probably a trip to Louisiana. I see Lucas on here. So um, probably a trip to Louisiana. Uh, Going to be a little bigger, a nine or a ten um for their for their big bull reds down there but uh but generally i, I would argue that an eight weight's probably the the most versatile rod and then in terms of a lot of other species if you are going to go fish for tarpon then i think most guys are going to point you in the direction of an 11. Um, <clears throat> if you're going to be more geared towards bonefish and permit then probably having an eight and a ten and a lot of those areas, you could probably get away with that 10 on so long as you're not really fishing for real big tarpon, if you could just take two rods. Um, what I mentioned about location as to what you're going to carry, um, you know, if you're going to make a big investment to make a big trip somewhere, um, like you're headed to Cuba or you're headed to Seychelles or you're headed someplace pretty far where you're not necessarily going to, you're not, you know, if you go to Cuba, you're not going to have any backup eight weights that you can walk down the street and buy. Um, so having a, a backup rod or two is probably not a bad idea in those situations. Whereas the alternative, if you're fishing in, uh, here or you're fishing, uh, up in, or like down in Savannah or someplace <coughs> like that, um, you know, a lot of your guides here are probably going to have most of the equipment may not be the rod. You'd still like to cast with your rod, say you caught the fish on your rod, but being able to have a, uh, a backup rod probably be in the boat. So you wouldn't have to carry as much equipment. Um, this question of how important is double haul to saltwater fly fishing? 
Um, I think it can be incredibly important. Um, and it's incredibly important from a standpoint, not only from distance, um, and even most people probably apply it most to how, how much wind there is. Um, it can also be important from an accuracy standpoint and just as important, I can't stress it enough in terms of being able to cast on a flats boat, having a solid back cast, um, which a double haul very much helps with is, uh, also extremely important for, you know, not everything happens on, uh, uh, you know, out at 10 o'clock or uh, off the boat where you can make a forward cast to a lot of things happen behind you or off to the right where a back <coughs> cast is going to be a much better uh, situation. So, uh, a double haul uh, over that, I, uh, but all those things is important. It's great for line control and obviously for, for windy situations. Um, not only, not only trying to cut the wind in front of you, but trying to deal with wind that's coming at your, uh, at your right shoulder, if you're right-handed. So, um, yeah, I want to add, I want to add, uh, just add something to that talk. Um, the most important thing is to be able to cast 40 feet in the wind quickly, right? Pick it up and drill it out there at 40 feet quickly. If you can do that without a double haul, that's great. Or 50 feet. If you can't, then a double haul is important. Yeah. I mean, the most important thing is getting the fly to the fish in, in the wind if you have to, at any direction, quickly. So Yeah, I, and I, you know, I'll, I talk about I, I I often talk about an instruction that, we, you know, we spend a lot of time teaching some schools down here. We teach these uh, two different Orvis saltwater schools here in Beaufort and uh, amongst a school that called the Redfish School that we do just here uh, out of the Outfitter. And there's there's all the work you can do on your cast um, as a, you know, when you're practicing in your yard um, mm -hmm. and and as you work on that and uh, you can watch your cast, watch your back cast, really focus on getting things proper making sure if you are hauling to be able to get into that back cast you return that rod that hand that that line hand to your rod and and vice versa in the forward cast things like that you can really watch the details when you're fishing you got to be you you know your cast is what it is now i mean i'm not saying you can't work on it while you're fishing but when you're actively in the moment to casting to a fish just like tom was talking about being able to work on um uh, being able to work on casting to the fish and not worry about how your cast looks. A fish does not care how your cast looks. I believe he might care how nice my boat looks, but he does not care how your cast looks. And so uh, make sure that you, at that point, you are casting, you are working towards getting your your cast accurate um, and, and focus towards the fish. This is not a time at that point to work on exactly how good it looks and 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 being perfect you know you need to work more at this point about fishing and basically what i'm saying is there is a practice time and there is a uh, a fishing time and and tom talking about that speed to get it to the fish uh can be important um the question here about textured line claim uh and uh, scared the fish um you know i grew up probably I mean, I grew up fly fishing from a very young age, but we did a fair amount of fishing with some different spinning rods. And I always remember turning the clicker off on those spinning rods when we were working artificials. And uh, I don't know that it really spooks all fish, um, but I'm sure that fish that are really spooky um, or can be spookier than others, that a textured line can be, could that line, that sound's going to travel down. I mean, I, I turn off my, every time I pull up on a flat, I turn off the sounder on my, uh, on my depth finder on my GPS depth finder. Cause I don't want that clicking noise going out and warning the fish I'm coming. And I know it makes a difference. So, uh, if I'm choosing, I'm not using a textured line, um, in our neck of the woods. Now, if I was fishing, I would assume if I was fishing cobia or striper or, uh, or I was fishing bonefish that are in a cloud where they're all just in there feeding. Or if I was fishing, a, you know, drifting in a stream with a, you know, I think those textured lines float really, really well. 
and there you're not stripping the line at all. So you have all the benefits of the textured line, but you don't have to worry about sound going down there. And something like Cobia, that may extract that fish. They're so aggressive and crazy. So, um, so I think there's places it could that a textured line makes more sense than others. But a spooky bonefish or a spooky tail and redfish back on a really quiet flat. Um, it's why, like for redfish too, I don't I don't really want anything bigger than an eight weight uh, that are that are tail in in a quiet environment. Uh, even a six or a seven's better because when the line hits the water, it's it's lighter. Uh, doesn't make as big a splash. So that brings us to line on, um, you know, I talked for a second earlier about how many things there are line wise. And there are, there are a bevy of things for the most part, a floating uh, tropical or uh, cold water, salt water line, some type of floating uh, fly line. This is a uh, saltwater tropic eight weight smooth um, that, I really, uh, this, this Orvis pro line is amazing stuff. Um, it, it, very little stretch if it, if it any, um, and, and it's it, what the important things to point out on this, this is a weight forward, um, floating line. If all of it floats, um, it is multicolored. So you can see, um, as most fly lines are today. So you can see where your, uh, tapered section is where your belly of the line, AKA all your weight in the fly line, and then the running part of your line. Um, I, every day, it seems like I tell somebody, I start stripping some line off, they get a little bit of line out. And if it's, a, if it's only two colors, I tell them to go to the color change, which usually means that the front part of, this, of the line and the belly are one color and the running line's a different color. That way I know that they have all of the weight forward section of their line off their reel. If it's tricolored, then I tell them to go to the second color at bare minimum, because now they've got 40 plus feet of line out. They have the, uh, they have all the weight forward section, um, and they have, and now they're just getting into the running line. Um, you cannot cast fly line that is on your reel. So, um, while you don't need excessive amounts of the running line out to just get all tangled up, um, having enough line out so that you can have that weight forward section, use that to cast and use that to shoot line with um, the you now you now have the ability to have that weight forward section to help you cast. If you don't have that off and a fish is out there that you could have cast to and that line was on the reel, well, you cannot cast to it. Um, so in terms of what we fish here, what you would fish on most bonefish flats. Um, a floating line, because we're in skinny water, is 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 essential. It's the right line. Um, you know, if you have some situations where you might have some tarpon in a trough, like or a, or a ditch, like in Cuba or in Belize, um, having a sinking line there uh, can really make a big difference. But this, you know, you can also with a floating line, you can vary your depth of what you're fishing both with the fly, how the wet, the fly is weighted, how fast you strip that fly, and also with your leader material. Uh, <clears throat> mono does not really sink, um, and, and it, but it can get pulled down, but it doesn't sink, and it certainly doesn't do it fast if it does it at all, uh, which is why mono is preferred for topwater flies like a gurgler or a priest fly or something like that, um, and while, whereas fluorocarbon uh, will sink, and why you don't want to put it on some type of topwater fly, um, and, and the other thing real quick on those materials, fluorocarbon is obviously going to be much, much less visible underwater. It's generally more abrasion resistant. Um, it generally has less stretch. Um, it also is not affected by, uh, UV rays for the most part. That is why you need to make sure that when you are done using any fluorocarbon, that it does not stay in the water, that it finds its way to a trash can that is going to uh, get it away from the water because it will not go away over time. Um, and then, uh, you know, but the, those types of things that, that, that material, it's usually mostly about, um, about abrasion resistance and, and how spooky fish are. Uh, and like I said, top water versus non top water. Um, Back to the fly line real quick too. Like this is a tropic line, like I said. Um, 
you might have a salmon line or you might have a striper line or something like that. Um, most of one of the main things in either species specific or something listed like tropic, it has to do with temperature of where you're going to fish water temperature as well as air temperature. If you took a salmon line and brought it here in July, it would be a sticky, sticky mess. Please don't do that. Um, that would be the worst of the two options. If you take a tropic line and go to a cold water environment, it's going to want to stay really kinked up. Um, and so the tropic line will stay, uh, have a harder, uh, exterior layer, um, or coating so that it can, uh, it can stay firm and slide through guides in warmer environments. Um, in terms of where we fish here, um, I generally in the, in the real cool months, I will fish in, uh, the Orvis all rounder. Um, it, even in pretty cold days, it still stays pretty, you know, non, it doesn't have too much memory. Um, about generally sometime in late April, though we've actually had a pretty mild spring here, then I will, uh, switch over to a, uh, uh, uh tropical line or even a bonefish line on my eight weights so that I have a, a line that will hold up in these really hot environments. Um, so, uh, we have a question here. Uh, what do you recommend for first species of fish to target as a beginner? Um, assume you can go anywhere. Uh, everybody's got a different opinion on this, but bonefish are scavengers. Um, <laughs> I would, I would argue, I'm not saying all bonefish are easy cause they're not, but, but bonefish, <laughs> they live in environments that have really clean water generally. Um, and, and they are, like I said, they're scavengers. And a lot of times, you know, you're going to have some refusals from them, but you can see them easier. Um, and, and they're pretty good at eating the fly. Um, I was really fortunate to be able to be down at El Pescador back in, I think that was March. And, uh, and we had a school, an Orvis school down there of eight guys and everybody caught, uh, everybody caught bonefish every day, uh, that they fished. So, um, it's, that was a great environment to get people started. Um, I think that a lot of times people think that something like a redfish is, is easier, but I do not agree with that. And I fish for them 200 days a year. So, um, not that they are necessarily always real difficult, but they can be. Um, so I, that would probably be my, if I'm assuming I could go anywhere, that'd probably be my, uh, my first choice. Um, so, um, in terms of, in terms of tippet material real quick, before we leave, uh, equipment, um, the, the tippet material, uh, you know, I didn't used to use much tippet material because fluorocarbon didn't used to cost what it costs now. Um, I'm really pretty good now at tying on tippet material. It's a, it, you'll find a lot of places that you go that a lot of your guides, if you're fishing with a guide, a lot of times you don't really need to know too many knots. Um, but but knowing uh, a knot to tie tip it now to to a, a leader to extend it a little bit so you can have a longer life and a, even a knotless extruded leader. Uh, you know, again, those fluorocarbon leaders across the board, fluorocarbon has gotten very expensive. So um, having some spools of tip it to be able to tie that, whether you tie it with a blood knot um, or a quick uh, even a regular surgeons, do not tie it with an improved surgeons. Um, if you want to challenge that, go test it on a, uh, on a scale and tell me which you will, you, you will find that an improved surgeon is a weaker knot than a regular surgeon's and it breaks right at the edge of the knot. And I think it's because of the heat that gets created. I tried it and tested it. I was like, there's no way this is true. It, it time and time again. Um, what's, an, what's an improved surgeon's third time through. Really? Yeah. yeah. And it will, it will break much earlier. I'll bet it's 25% weaker. So, no uh, yeah, yeah. If you test, I mean, I tested on a, on a cheap little <clears> luggage. <throat> yeah. First, first, uh, that was years and years ago. First bonefish trip I ever took after fishing for these redfish for so long. I was like, I want to know all about how we're going to, you know, I tested them and tested them. And, and back then I, like I said, I didn't hardly tie any tip it on. Cause I, uh, you know, fluorocarbon leaders weren't very expensive. So, um, but anyways, or blood knot. Um, and then the other knot that I tie a lot on my flies is a, uh, um, 
I tie a uh, non-slip loop knot on the fly. Um, there's plenty of other options, but I like a loop knot, uh, Duncan loop. Uh, uh, I like a loop knot onto the fly because I can see what is happening where it attaches to the fly. If I tie, a lot of people like a loop knot because they feel like it gives the fly better movement. Not saying that's not true, but the main thing for me is every day, every every time every time I pull a fly off a rod for a guy, every time I clean a piece of grass off a fly, whatever it is, I look at that. I can move the fly around, see the loop, and see if there is any abrasion to that loop, and therefore I know that it's not going to be an issue. Um, so another question here, first trip to Florida Keys this summer, planning on a lot of flats fishing. How do you uh, stage for a quick cast, meaning holding the fly and the line, etc.? cetera? Um, first off, please do not hold the fly. Um, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't know very many of the names here that are listed, but I guarantee, just like most of us, uh, all of us have a certain amount of body oils and have some amount of body odor to those body oils. Um, that Dan is the Frazier main does for sure. Oh yeah. Dan Frazier's. Yeah. Well, that's Definitely. very true. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> gosh, we're going to, we're going to, you're going to, we're going to pay for that when it's, I know we are. I know. We are. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, but in terms of those oils, um, I've heard astronomical numbers of how much better a, a Labrador can smell than me as a human and and then how much more a salmon can smell than a labrador i don't think a redfish can smell as well as a salmon because he doesn't need to but i will tell you a redfish has two nostrils he also has two appendages that come off of his pectoral fins that are meant uh to be able to pick up the smell of crabs down in little holes um as he's swimming around so he has four things on him that will pick up smell um i do not want that fly to smell like me um so don't hold the fly Hold the leader. Um, the other reason not to hold the fly too is when you get ready to cast it, you know, I watch it all the time. It happens to all of us um, where buck fever is a thing in fishing as well. And you get in a hurry and try to uh, make a cast to a fish and your heart starts racing. I, you know, you're, you're likely to hook yourself if you're holding a fly. So um this is kind of how my ready position goes from start to finish. When you first get up on the front of the boat, um, or if you are fish or stripping into a stripping basket, cause you're on a beach front, um, then strip your line off, make a cast because now when you strip that line off, it came off the reel. And as it came off the reel, it piled on top of itself. So the stuff that's supposed to go out of the rod has got to come from under the pile. And, what you want to do is strip that line off the reel, make a cast out, and then restack that fly line. Um, though on a, a den or an addendum to that is we want to make sure that when we uh, bring line back in, if it's loose around the boat, do the same thing. Don't take both ends of the line and make loops in your hand and drop it into the boat or onto, you know, I use when it's real windy, I'll use uh, one of the carbon marine mats that's got the little nipples on it. If you make loops with both ends, then a lot of your line is laying under itself again. So, and it'll wrap around things more that way. Always back, uh, back strip it so that what is coming, going out of the rod is laying on top of the pile. Um, then you want to make sure you have enough fly line out of the tip of the rod so that you can get a load uh, on that line or on that rod. So if you only have, you know, your nine feet of leader, let's say, and then you have a two feet of fly line, it's going to be very, you're going to have to make two extra false casts to get that going. You should have a little bit of a, a belly falling from that rod. Um, the, uh, the color of the line can help with that too. A lot of times you'll, if you, if you're in that first piece of color, if it's a tricolor line, you're at feast, all that first piece of colors hanging out, then, then you're going to quickly get into the belly from there. So make that, um, uh, make that a habit so that you have some line there, either hold the leader. I'm kind of a big proponent of, um, if, if there's nothing at home, there's no seaweed, there's no oysters, uh, no mussels, things like that. Just lay the line in the water because now you're going to have a little water tension to pick up. If you're in the marsh grass, or you got some oyster around you. That's not an option. 
Um, but either way, now you've got, um, now you're in the ready position, keeping that rod. I usually keep it in my, uh, casting hand. I see a lot of people that don't, but, um, but keep it in your casting hand and keep it kind of pointed out, not up. And the reason for that is that's a very good tool as a guide to be able to say, uh, point your rod just a little right or a little left. And as you come up to stop, you see that fish right there, he's moving from left to right. You can make a cast. It's a really good tool to be able to uh, give direction, even from a, not just a side to side standpoint. But if I've got a guy that's he's pointing out here and he's and he's straight ahead a little ways. But where he's pointing, if we drew a laser, would be way out. The fish is much closer. He's looking down the rod. He's looking 100 feet out. But if he'll tip that rod down a little bit, now he's looking 50 feet out and so it's not always just about left and right. It can be about up and down as well. Um, and in that way, too, if you've got a second person in the boat um, or if you're the second person in the boat, uh, I will say that that women or wives are better at doing this than us guys are, it seems, where in terms of because they just pay attention and want to help out, it seems more. But if you're on a cooler, you know, stay with what's going on. You'll learn more from your other angler and help manage that fly line. That's what I'm talking about where we're, where the other team member is on the cooler, making sure that you're not standing on the fly line on the front of the boat, that the fly line's not wrapped around the, uh, you know, a, sh a shoe that's laying on the deck, wh whatever it is, um, that line management or more, more likely the lines laying on the, the loose lines laying in the water, um, and where we, we don't want that water tension there, we can bring it in the boat. Um, yeah, I, I remember someone once telling me years ago where they were like, if I ever get thrown out of an airplane and I have a parachute, just give me some fly line. I'll get it caught on something. And, <laughs> and that is definitely the case in everything we do out there. So, um, so anyways, that kind of answers that question and, and being ready, um, and, and it is so important to, you know, cause it's like, if you want it to rain, go outside and wash your car. If, if you want a good shot to show up, then go ahead and start paying attention to what's going on by the cooler or, or, or look over your right shoulder, at something over here, or get your fly line tangled. That's when those shots will show up. So, uh, mm -hmm. that, that can really make just being aware of what's going on. Don't be hyper-focused that you'll also miss things then. Um, you know, pay attention to the birds, pay attention to let your eyes float around. I can't talk enough about when we, the way that, that, that you see things, you see fish roll, or you see just the littlest, tiniest difference in already ripply water, but a fish kind of just makes a little swirl. Um, when I was at Clemson, my, the thing I, I, the, I didn't major in fishing, but the thing that I took away most was from my perception class that I use more than anything on the water um, in terms of our peripheral vision is invaluable. Let your eyes float around. Your peripheral vision sees so much more detail because it's built out of defense for you. Uh, you know, if, if something gets thrown at you from the side over here, you will react before you even look at it. Uh, use that peripheral vision to, to notice little details. Uh, and that's how you will find and see more fish, um, whether it's bonefish or, you know, big brown cobia cruising under some uh, rough water. Um, so in terms of uh, we had a question earlier about fly selection, uh, specifically good redfish flies. Um, there are, you know, the fact of the matter is, is I kind of believe while redfish can be fussy, um, they generally eat or they don't. Um, there are some things that we can be that can very much be in our favor in terms of what we're going to do with a fly and fly selection. But the fact of the matter is, is that if we throw a, maybe just a couple different versions of flies and they don't eat, they're probably not they're probably not going to eat. Uh, if you see some true refusals on a couple different things, um, that being said, um, there are some great, uh, like when we're fishing for, I think that question was specific to, uh, um, specific to redfish, uh, here in the low country, predominantly are redfish that are inshore, which means that they are in their first three and a half to four and a half years of life. 
and they are somewhere between a few inches up to about 35, 36 inches. Um, Non-spawning age, once they get that big, then they leave and go into deeper water. But during that three and a half to four and a half years of age, they eat mostly crabs. Um, this uh, this Puglisi descent crab, or descent, I think it's maybe even called a descendant crab. Um, also, I've always known as a you know a flexo kind of crab. Uh, what this material is actually is a uh, um, it's electrical conduit for like behind computers and things like that. It's it, it's small tubing. Uh, if it was bigger, it would look like one of those little Chinese uh, handcuff things that you put on your fingers. And you just take it and you push it, you tie it off and then you push it together and it opens up and it makes that disc and then you tie it, um, tie it uh, on the other end. And before that you put, there's some lead eyes in there. Um, but that being said, generally our tailing redfish um, that are up in the grass, they're definitely eating fiddlers. Um, and this is a phenomenal pattern for that but other crab patterns generally i'm throwing something a little darker versus lighter uh for our tailing fish i'll come back to that color thing in a second but um but also uh, in that tailing situation crabs don't move as fast generally <laughs> um i'd like to you know we could have that discussion with a blue crab when he's running from a bonnet head shark here but generally crabs are more on the bottom they're not real fast moving especially fiddler crabs um, they're more likely to try to disappear into holes as their defense than be able to actually get away. So um, the uh, the other types of things that I like to throw would be something that could be somewhere between a crab, shrimp, something like that for these tailing fish. Um, and this fight and flea fiddler uh, also uh, really works for that. I think that the reason this works so well is the this could be this tail here which is some little foam discs um will kind of act like either a sand eel tail or a um or a, a, a claw on a crab as the as the crab is swimming away uh most crabs if they're really in a fleeing moment uh move faster sideways than they do backwards or forwards so they'll often have that one claw sticking out as a defense mechanism uh, you'll even notice that if they have lost a claw, then they'll only swim in the direction where they have lost that claw. So they still have their defense mechanism claw going uh, back, you know, where they're coming from. Um, now, in terms of selection for more mudflat fish, uh, fish that are more in open water, I'm generally more likely to throw something more shrimpy. Um, uh, and when I say that, I really, honestly, one of my favorite flies, and I, I didn't, I would have never really thought it until I fished it a good bit because I fished it in Cuba a fair amount. Uh, but is this Avalon fly or this uh, keel shrimp is another name for it. Um, this is a great redfish pattern. Um, that being said, as a, as a great redfish pattern, um, talking about color a second ago, I wouldn't fish this in dirty water. So let me come back to, to talk about color real quick. So these are the same fly, this fight and flea fiddler. Um, one is, sorry, I, this camera thing, it's backwards on me. So I'm going this way and all over and it doesn't really show where I am. But anyways, so um, if the water's really dirty or I have low light conditions, I'm going to throw this this dark one. Um, the This flight and flea fiddler here, it's got dark purple legs uh black up front something like this also in black and purple uh great redfish fly um whereas if i'm in lighter you know cleaner conditions and i have better sunlight then i'm more likely to throw something that's tan like this more natural colors or real light colors of uh of like this keel shrimp um or even if I was throwing a, like a little clouser, I might would throw this little uh, foxy minnow in uh, in a natural, real natural, nice color um, for cleaner water. Um, and that way, the thing is, is those darker colors silhouette more and it's a lot easier for the fish to see. Um, it is important to think about colors when you're pick, talking about flies. 
Um, the, the flies that, um, the flies you'll find or colors you'll see. One of the best things I found out there, I had to do a presentation one day about matching the hatch uh, up for saltwater flies. And I found a website and I don't, I don't know the name of that site right now, but it's something like paint, paintyourlure.com or, and it's all about painting, you know, wooden or even plastic bait fish lures for spinning rods. And one, and they talked about the difference of wave action. So refraction of light coming underwater. They talked about, um, uh, the amount of sun. They talked about the clarity of the water. And then in relation, they talked about what colors disappeared under the water first. Uh, red was the first color to go away with no refraction, full sunlight, gin clear water at five feet gone. And, and so, but the last things to go away were navy, black, purple, things like that. So in low light conditions or really muddy conditions, it, having a pink fly, it's got a bunch of mirror flash. There's no light to light it up. So you've got to have that. You're much better off to have that darker pattern. Another thing about fly selection and where we fish. Um, and then I'll get to this question from Dan. Thankfully, it's actually a real question, Dan. Um, the, uh, um, the other thing about fly selection is in terms of weight. Um, so often, especially with bonefish, you'll see bonefish that are flies that are unweighted and they call those tailing flies or like a plastic bead chain, then a metal bead chain, then a deep water bonefish fly that's got a lead eye. Um, so those differently would be how spooky the fish might be according to how uh, deep the water is, but it also matters how deep the water is in terms of splash and things like that. Also what's on bottom. We were fishing redfish one day with a razzmatazz um, and it had an eye in it like this guy does. This is not a razzmatazz, but we had an eye in it, real heavy dumbbell eye and the fish just, they were eating really well and then they just stopped. And as we got up farther, um, we got hooked into something and I put my hand down in the water, followed the leader in and I found that the fly was connected to like a stick or something that was literally that far under the mud column. Well, no wonder they thought beating it because it all of a sudden got really soft and muddy. And so the fly was disappearing and we couldn't see it or they couldn't see it. So we changed to something that had a little tiny bead chain eye on it. And guess what? They ate it. So, um, that can be important too, uh, from a weight standpoint, um, so, uh, Dan here says the first time I fished on your boat, you accused me of having happy feet. Can you talk about casting with stationary feet? Yes. Um, I see it a good bit where when you're on the boat, you are in a situation where you are, people will sway with their cast. Um, that's, that's bad from a standpoint of, uh, of your feet lifting up and getting on your fly line. It's bad on a standpoint, sometimes getting off balance a little bit and moving your feet where they will hit the deck and spook fish. It's also bad. Some boats are worse about it than others, but it's also bad from a standpoint of the boat rocking and creating uh, wake out of in front of the boat. Um, so, uh, and, you know, probably the worst being sound if we end up lifting our feet. Um, so being able to lean against something or being up on a, you know, if you've got a pulley, our casting platform on the front of a boat, a lot of times that will help because the fly line then falls off the sides. I have a very small casting platform so that people can't walk around on it um, and therefore have less chance of having uh, any kind of happy, happy feet. Um, so I think that kind of answers Dan's question there. I mean, that the, uh, yeah, you see it all the time. Your foot's gonna, your foot's gonna step on fly line at the most in, inopportune, uh, uh, times. Uh, what's up, Todd? Um, the, uh, best time of year to fish flood tides is generally from April through this April was not great, but, uh, because of how cool it was kind of started off great, but it, then it kind of dwindled. But generally April through November um, and and therefore also in terms of not just the time of year, but you want they're going to happen around full moons or new moons um, where we have minimum amounts of you know, a minimum amount of water that would get up onto these flats. 
Also, east wind will affect how much water gets on these flats uh, in terms of pushing more water in. And if you're right on the cusp of having enough, um, having enough water, then then a west wind can can make that not happen. Uh, you may end up having that pull water out. So, uh, but again, through the summer, my favorite time of year to fish here actually is in the pretty hot months uh, in a nice evening flood tide where we end up fishing and we and the and we're fishing into the dark. And then we can uh, just idle back and have a beer, watch the sunset as it gets done. So those are definitely uh, those flood tides in the evening are really pretty special through the through the summer months and into the fall. Um, hey, Amy, I got your text today. I will respond about fishing in July. I see that name pop up over there. So um, in terms of kind of preparation for a trip as we kind of are coming through everything here, um, and again, you guys, I know we're getting a little close on time, so, uh, please get any questions in you have, um, um, in terms of getting prepped for a trip, you know, packing for a trip can be kind of daunting depending on where you're going. Make sure you talk to the guide. Um, that is part of the stuff I do with building anglers. So it's probably the number one question I get from building anglers, people sending me, uh, emails to tuck at buildinganglers.com or text or whatever is they want to know what they need to take um, wherever they're going. And uh, for the most part, I can get those. Even if I don't have a, the right answer on something, I can, I, I can get it. Most of the time, I've been enough of these places that I do have the correct answers. Um, if you're going to buy one piece of equipment for, uh, and I give this same plug, I know people have heard, somebody, plenty of people here on this have heard this. But if you're going to buy one piece of equipment to travel with, this Safe Passage uh, rod bag is a amazing and essential, as far as I'm concerned, piece of equipment. Um, you can take your rods out of the tubes. The rod, this rod bag is hard enough on the outside edges that you take your rods out of your tubes, leave them in your rod sacks, put them in there. You can carry, you can carry more than five rods, but you can easily carry five rods. You can carry a change of clothes. All this is not only to carry the equipment, but to carry at least enough stuff to be able to fish the first day. Um, meaning that if your luggage gets lost when you arrive and you're freaking out because you don't have what you need to fish the next day, uh, this bag is essential for that. Um, the From a standpoint of this bag too, I usually take an outfit. I take a pair of boxer shorts. I take, uh, take all my flies in this bag. Um, I take a TSA uh, print out from their website about fishing lures. Um, you can just go to hunting and fishing TSA. You can print out the webpage and you can, uh, therefore have that with you. When, if anybody challenges you from TSA, don't try this leaving Mexico, um, to, uh, they, they say something about your flies, um, not being okay. Cause they're sharp. It, it says in that paperwork that you are allowed to have that with you. So take that with you in this bag as well. Um, I take all my leaders, take all my tippet material. Um, and that way in this bag, I've got, like I said, everything to fish for the next day. Uh, and it's, it fits wonderfully in every, seems like every, uh, uh, spot above the seats and in planes. So it, it travels well also. Um, and then, uh, in terms of casting practice, we talked that for a moment earlier about, um, being prepared, uh, for a quick cast if need be. Um, when you're casting and you're, and you're practicing in the yard, you don't necessarily need to go out there and cast for an hour and a half. You're better off to take it into small segments. You're not going to be casting on the boat for that long. You're going to be casting more, um, in a situation on the boat where you're going to take shots. So therefore you don't need to, you're not going to, don't wear your arm out casting and form bad habits. The thing to practice is just like we said, that quick kind of cast, uh, double haul is a good thing to practice in terms of accuracy. Um, put some things out there like a Frisbee or um, if you have a kid that's got an RC car that he can drive around and you can work on leading that, that's a good idea. But generally, that's not an option. So a rock, uh, you know, just a bare piece of grass, whatever it is, um, use those as targets, but don't try to hit the target try to lead the target. Think about that target moving left to right, right to left, coming at you, going away from you, whatever the case is. 
Um, so uh, that way, because if you show up here and you've been hitting the target, I'm going to show you a tailing fish and you're going to hit the tailing fish. So uh, that's why I generally, um, why I generally don't uh, tell people to cast to the target. Um, and talk to your guide, whether before um, or even the day of, talk to your guide about uh, your expectations. Um, saltwater fishing to me is the kind of thing where with a, um, your expectations are, it, it, they can all be really high and saltwater fishing can be tough. Um, so I kind of believe that if you want to do well in saltwater fishing, you got to go, you got to, you know, you can't just fish, you know, you, you don't want to go to a trip to down here, honestly, if you're coming from a good ways away and fish one day, um, that's per that's pigeonholing what this weather is going to do. Now, so far this particular week, we're on Thursday. Um, Sunday was amazing. Uh, Monday was pretty good. Uh, Tuesday was okay. Uh, yesterday was not great. Today was not great. And tomorrow doesn't look like it'll be great. So, and then we get back to it being good. So, uh, having a couple days on the books makes sense, or at least getting getting to fish on it uh, a fair amount uh, would be good as well. Um, and then in terms of uh, the day of the trip, um, when you whether you whether you're meeting a guide like here, we meet at boat landings. Uh, whether you're meeting a guide uh, at the boat landing, go ahead and have the rod together, have the line pulled through the rod. A guide's probably going to be fine to do that, but if you go ahead and have all that together uh, and ready, if you guys are meeting at seven, you get in the boat at seven, all you got to do is tie a fly on, you can go. Not having to string the rod up. Um, if you have not, um, if you've not used that line in a while or ever, uh, go ahead and tell the guide that. It might, might not be a bad idea. We did it this morning on some new line where you drag it behind the boat. That's a much better way of stretching line than pulling tight the kinks in it. Um, when you put it out behind the boat, just take all the fly line off, leave the fly off, let it drag behind the boat while you're at a pretty good, you know, good tension on the rod. So a fair amount of speed, that line can stretch and it can uncoil. When you pull tight and try to stretch that fly line, go put it under a microscope and you'll see all you're doing is tightening and coils. So, um, if you have that option to be able to drag it behind a boat, it will change that fly line immensely. Um, uh, we talked about that ready casting position already to answer a question. Um, that is uh, kind of essential on the front of the boat. Um, talk to your guide too about stripping techniques. Um, I cast, I strip this crab pattern very differently than I do, uh, than I would strip this little bonefish pattern um, or even, or even how I would strip this clouser. So, most of what we do here, we're stripping, you know, what I call a tick, 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 tick kind of strip. Uh, we're getting as much movement out of the fly without the fly really going anywhere because redfish are kind of lazy. If you do that to a bonefish, you'll be tick, 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 and he'll be pop, pop, pop right behind it. He'll keep missing it. You'd think because he's quick, he would get it, but it's because he's quick, he goes to right where it was. So you'll find a lot of times that those strips don't work for them. Um, and then in terms of, and then I'm going to answer some questions, um, in terms of fighting technique in the salt, um, we generally don't do any trout sets. Uh, I see it a lot and it usually goes poorly for us, but more often than not, when we are stripping the fly, we are never using the rod to move the fly with, and we are stripping pointed straight at the fly. So often I see people that want to dip that rod really down. That's no different than having it up. The, the rod will flex and the fly will not move naturally. Point it straight at the fly, strip straight away, tick, 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 or whatever your strip technique, wherever you are, is. And, and then that way, um, now you are directly in line with that fly to give a good strip strike. On a redfish, we generally strip strike and pull the rod to the side. We do not pull the rod up. On a cobia, we generally strip as fast as humanly possible and keeping that rod directly at that fly. And we set the hook with that rod pointed pretty much straight at the fly without any movement of the rod. 
when the as the fish is turning away with it, strip it hard. We may even set it a second time because of how firm their mouth is, similar to how you would fish a tarpon, and then pull the rod to the to the side at that point. That does not mean you want to fight that fish with that rod way to the side. You want to fight that fish. If you get back here and he comes screaming at you, you got nowhere to go. Get that get that rod back down towards that fish so that you are fighting it in the butt, not just pulling back, but pulling the whole thing towards you. Um, really, some really big fish. I, I have watched some amazing fish that should that you would think would take forever to catch. Um, you know, hundred pound tarpon should not take an hour to fight. Uh, if you are doing it right, um, using the butt of that rod to really, and the, and the drag in that reel, not just pumping with the rod and getting way back and putting all kind of flex in it. It may be easier on you, but in the long term, it's much harder on a fish that's fighting for its life. So listen to your guide. If, if uh, the best tarpon fisherman I've ever been with um, was more like a personal trainer when it was like a full contact sport, as he put it, when we were fighting tarpon and it's all just down and dirty. That's not required on a bonefish or redfish or things like that, but it's still not the right thing to a redfish to just baby it in after it's after and, and taking a long period of time. They'll fight you better too when you fight them hard. Um, so um, uh, this question that's on the screen here is outside of season. Do you think trout fishing is more, uh, challenging than redfish fishing is now? The question is, is that question about my trout here or is that question about freshwater trout fishing? Um, I think he means freshwater trout. Yeah, I, he probably does. You know, I, that's there's such a broad scope of trout fishing. Um, but I, I, you could make an argument for things to be super difficult on either side. Um, for, for depends sure. on the for day Gary. too, right? It depends, depends on the, on day, the day and, and the, the conditions. And yeah. And, and either one wanna, can be impossible. Yeah, you want to see me try to mend a fly line in a little trout stream. I'm, it's that's more difficult, but that's probably not most <laughs> difficult for people to do it all the time. So, um, how do you plan for windy days? Haven't been fishing salt water here in New England, Florida, been extremely windy. Um, well, I mean that, that, like we talked about with that double haul, being able to also cast much more to the side. Cause there's sometimes you're going to have optimally, you're going to have the wind coming from your, if you're right-handed, you're going to have the wind coming from your left shoulder across your body where the line is being blown away from you. That is the op best situation. Some people believe that it would be better to be at your back. I believe it is better to come from your, your non-casting shoulder to your casting shoulder so that the line is being pushed away from you. Um, and so the uh, being able to cast more off to the side to try to mimic that is can be really good because also not only is it then away from your body, but if even... I, you know, I notice it all the time standing up on the platform that my pants are moving around and the guy that's up on the front, his pants aren't moving at all. There's a huge difference of wind level um, in just a six foot range. So having that ability to cast lower to the water and being much lower uh, can be very handy. Um, you also have to remember that there are days in salt water, depending on where you are, that the wind's just too much. Um uh, I'm not saying it becomes impossible that you're going to catch fish, but it becomes pretty darn close. Um, it depends on where you're fishing too. You know, here, when we get real windy, uh, we try to fish. I spent a lot of time in the back of a tiny, tiny little Creek today that I had to back the boat out of probably 25 yards. And, um, and even there it, we were, we were no more than 50 yards from a tree line and it was still windy. Um, so sometimes that, that wind can be too much, but being able to double haul and, you know, tighten that loop a lot in that cast, um, and, and being able to have good line management in those windy situations is also, all those things are really, uh, key and having some smaller flies can help too, um, to be able to get things turned over, maybe a little shorter leader with a quicker taper, uh, is not a bad idea either. Um, have you had any clients that are hand amputees? And if so, how did they strip the fly? 
how would you do it if you had to? Ooh, um, I have not had that the case. I've had some different situations. Um, I would think that no different than when we are um, some people with cobia. I don't think it's required, but some people with cobia for speed of the fly, they will take and tuck that rod under their arm and two hand strip it. Um, I would think uh, that if that was if if you had uh, one hand, um, been being able to cast using probably that hand to kind of manage the casting line as well as the rod, um, then you could tuck, tuck that rod under your arm and, and strip from under the rod. I would be the, uh, Tom, have you experienced that at all or have any other ideas that might, would be good? I haven't, but that sounds, that sounds like it would be the best solution. Tuck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um oh tim johnson um how you doing tim tim just sent us some amazing amazing artwork on uh some rod handles for our cobia tournament that we just did to help raise money for the port royal sound foundation down here um and uh we if you go if you go look at uh the cobia fly invitational instagram page i've got at least one of them pictured there. I'm going to put some of the other ones up too. I can't, t I just can't get over. And I've said this to some other people and I, I can be a bit dramatic at times, but I'm not being on this. When we opened the package of those, we, we knew we'd get something cool. We just stood there. Two of us just, we didn't have anything to say. We just is amazing artwork. So thanks for that, Tim. And they were uh, very well received by all, all six of the winners. So it's two, uh, three, th uh, two man teams. Uh, that all took home some of his great artwork on uh, on six different fly rods. So we appreciate it. So he has now, there, here. There's two Tim Johnsons that come in on these, and I think this is our friend Tim Johnson, but I think they both have trout on their icons. Okay. So. so it could be a different. Could be a <laughs> just different the Arizona one, Tim Johnson. <laughs> yeah, that the, Tim yeah. Johnson, the Tim Johnson of this. Oh, I figured that was his stuff right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah cool. Yeah. Um, so which species gets an, ex, uh, experienced saltwater guide like yourself, most excited? What do you like to hunt most? So when, uh, at this point, I, the most exciting thing for me is to watch other people, um, make a shot at a tailing redfish or, uh, or, or stay calm enough when a 50 pound Kobe is barreling down on the fly to do everything right. That is still the most exciting. I want to be on the back of the boat helping with that more than anything. But you're, that is not your question. Um, the really answer that, I want it as technical as possible. Um, I would much rather, like the coolest thing I've done recently, I was in a in Belize in a little canoe with somebody, a buddy, uh, uh, guy named Isa on the back, Poland, and uh as well as an, another day and a guy named mario arno on the back um that and mariano and isa put me in these tight little pockets that were like as small as as small as like a living room could be and we're casting and trying to put it up under mangroves with topwater gurglers uh things like this guy which are tie gurglers by the way put a put a uh, sequin on the front of them they work better um mm -hmm. The uh, and putting those gurglers up under those mangroves, just you know, that to me, where we'd have these baby tarpon or snook come out, uh, you know, making it the most likely that you were going to screw up the shot. Um, the more difficult and leave it to us as fly anglers, leave it to us as um, uh, you know, if, if guys that hunt with a bow or or a 410, or you know, we make we try to make it as difficult as possible. And that to me, I just love, I would much rather go and make it super technical. So I think honestly going and throwing uh, gurglers in some place like the Everglades with my buddy, Billy Faulkner, um, I, uh, you know, so much room for error. Um, but seeing those fish come up and blow up when you make a perfect cast that you skip up under those mangroves, that's, that's still my favorite thing to do by far. So, um, we have any other questions here, Tom? Uh, uh, well, single-handed is asking about a double haul with one hand, and I, I honestly don't know. 
I think, you know, Pete Kutzer can cast an entire fly line without a double hull. So, again, it, as I stressed before, it, it's not necessary. It helps, but it's, it, you know, it you got – you gotta you gotta fix your casting first, and I, I would concentrate on on working on just a straight overhead cast with distance and accuracy. I, I wouldn't try to double haul. I, I don't I don't see how you would easily do it with uh, only one hand. No, I tend to agree. You know, in that situation. Um, but you know what you yeah. might single handed what you might do is. Um, is is talk to a therapist you know a physical therapist uh, and explain what you're trying to do they may have some they may have some mm -hmm. better thoughts i mean I, I don't have any experience with it but i think it would be difficult yeah um there's a warren horn right above that said something about being left being a lefty is a problem um i don't know why that would be the case at all um I said earlier in terms of left-handed, right-handed, whatever, um, yeah. when one of the most critical things in a, in a saltwater toolbox casting wise is being able to make a good back cast. Um, I see it all the time, all the time where we we're on the front of the boat, we're making this cast. And then all of a sudden we have a shot that's back here. And what a guy will do is he'll go. And instead of just making a back cast, He'll try to come around his body and do this. Well, there's no way to close a loop up doing that. So know how to, um, you know, I talk about all the time when I'm teaching casting of, of casting in line with that thumbnail and thumbprint so that we are always straight in line with our, with our plane. If you make a normal back cast, when you go to lay that back cast back here, why would you, why would you rotate around? It's no different. And you have more support in the back cast too, because of the way your elbow is structured, you know, holding and shoulders, holding everything together versus being out front. So work on learning to, um, to make that back cast, at, you know, right in line with your and stop there. Once you stop and it starts to unfold, then you can follow the line down. Um, it's a, it's really important. Um, and, yeah, the uh, lefty a lefty is going to have no an advantage fifty percent of the time, right? Depends on right. which side of the boat the fish come to. So you're well, not, you're like not what, disadvantaged by being a lefty. What we do, I spend plenty of times. I spent, I had to pull down a bank right-handed caster today, where I was leaving. You know, his back cast was the one facing the bank because that's where the sun angle was, and uh, if we pulled into it as the sun was coming up, we wouldn't have been able to see anything. Um, so. Uh, the and then Tom, uh, uh, Tim Johnson here uh, says uh, there's an adaptive equipment available for people who fish without a hand. Stuff to check out. Look at some of the fly fishing charities that work with disability or dis disabled veterans, especially. Um, so I'm I, I know that that kind of stuff goes on. I'm not a, aware of the specifics of what he's talking about there, but I imagine that could be worked on uh, or looked at through Google. Um, so. Uh, ah, Jamie Lyle. Yeah. There you go. Line Dale Brown feet, marked his line. Tried to cast line the ball needed. No double so, hole needed at this distance. Um, yeah. So I'll see a lot of people mark their line. You know, they'll they'll uh, also mark their line from a standpoint of what they can pick up quickly. Um, so they'll mark. I, I've seen some people that'll mark their line in multiple places whatever the most fly line that they feel comfortable picking up is, uh, they'll mark it there. So they know if they need to be in a hurry and change a direction, um, that they've got that as a, uh, uh, a notice that, that, that they've reached to that point. Um, and, and then also some people will mark the back of the, the belly or the weight forward section. So they know when that's hit their hand. Um, there's a couple different reasons to do it. Um, you know, it just, from a double haul standpoint, we, you know, we can, there's a lot of discussion that can be had on it. Um, I have seen some presentations where people have tried, you know, one is saying it doesn't that important and another one saying it is really important. 
And the things on the side of why a double haul is more important um, is that for some people, uh, they feel like it gives them more accuracy to their cast to be able to be more in control of the of that what that loop is doing, not just with the cast, but also with the uh, left hand um, or with the, the line hand. Um, I tend to be more on that side of the camp, seeing what I see. I definitely have had guys that could not double haul. And once they learn to double haul, they catch more fish. I know it. I'm, I've seen it. I've seen it all the time. So I will, I will stand more on the side of, of the double haul. But, um, but I agree, too, that doesn't mean you can leave all your other fin- fundamentals behind. Um, the double haul will not fix uh, poor casting with your casting hand. Um, I f- uh, and then uh, Warren here uh, has written, I find that you have to tell a guy you are a lefty so they can get you in the right spot. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would want I like to know when what direction they're casting in. But but we should be, we you know, as a guide, we, we're going to know that real quick. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, Tuck, how long does it take you to figure out that a guy's a lefty or a, or a woman is a lefty when you get him in the boat? Like yeah, 10 seconds. Long. That's yeah. right. So um, Warren, if you if you got guy if you got guys that get you to a spot and haven't figured out that you're a lefty, I think you better maybe look for some better guides. Look at some different guides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh Lord, have you seen Dan Frazier's next question? Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put it up too. All right. Yeah. So when I was teaching you how to cast for distance, what was the best tip I gave you? I'm, Dan, you've given me a lot of really, you actually have just recently gave me some uh, really good advice, but it wasn't about casting. Um, so, uh, and the worst thing that Dan ever did was the first time he came fishing, I put him in the other guy's boat because it was a two boat trip because he was wearing a university of South Carolina Gamecocks hat and that does not sit well with me in my boat. So, um, uh, so anyways, but no, Dan's a, uh, Dan's a fine caster for sure. Um, so the, uh, I, you know, we probably ought to, uh, kind of get, kind of wrap things up. One thing, a couple things I will say in terms of being a better angler, um, salt water, fresh water, whatever. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of guys, I fish with a lot of guys, the best anglers that I know, um, are guys that they care about catching fish and they care about being out there and, and making the best of the opportunities. Um, but they are very relaxed and, um, and they are excited to be outdoors and they are, um, and they are able to stay calmer in the moments because it is not life and death. It's just fishing. Um, and I can't tell you the difference, the guys that I see that are over-focused that are really like, you know, just, they get into, I have one guy that I'll say, as soon as I say it, sometimes I, I'll say it, if somebody else is a boat I, that I know, I'll be like, well, we're going to get him to do it. Cause he'll do it every time. And I'll say, you know, something like, okay, indicating that I, I'm, I see something and he goes into like that, you know, crouching tiger kind of stance. He has now gotten away from that and he's a better fisherman than I've ever seen from him. He's much more relaxed, spends a lot of time, um, spends a lot of time, uh, 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 working on his cast for short periods of time now and, and is a much, just much better angler because of it. And the other thing I will say too, you know, learn from your experiences on the water um, and whether they're mistakes, whether they were situations that you that weren't especially fun, um, whether they're refusals from fish. Uh, I remember one of my one of my best anglers uh, that I get to experience on the boat years ago. We were pulling down a flat and it was him. And I think maybe Patty Riley was in the boat. And uh, I think that's who was in the boat with her, with us and a guy named Martin. And she makes this cast to this redfish and it is right. I mean, it's coming. It's everything's perfect. Leads the fish just right. Strips that fly right in front of the fish. Fish speeds up just a little bit, tips down, stops, and then goes around the fly, 
gets right back on its path and keeps on going. <laughs> and she's, you know, you could see she's just like totally dejected. And Martin's like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. And I'm like, and Patty and I'm like, what, what was amazing? Didn't eat. He's like, that was the most beautiful refusal I have ever seen. <laughs> and, I, and I think about it every time now where what if we'd done something just a little different or what if we really focused on maybe that we didn't in that moment. And I don't know. I don't in, in that moment. I don't think she did anything wrong. But if we go back and think about it where it's like, all right, well, maybe we didn't uh, and we don't want to overanalyze it, but maybe we, we stopped the fly and it and that one little stop. It had been moving. And now the fish doesn't want to eat it. You know, if you do that on a Kobe, it's definitely not going to eat it. So learn from from mistakes um and 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 have a sense of humor about them because as soon as you get upset and you tap your foot down or you slam something that you you know get off balance have those happy feet because you're mad guess what you just spooked another three fish so uh you know that positive attitude and uh you take dan frazier's question down we've answered that one i don't want people to read more about him um but the uh <laughs> the um but that that learning from those mistakes can be so key and, and be a, uh, a function of, of becoming a better angler. The, you know, if you just come and fish and you're upset that you didn't catch fish or you didn't make a shot or, um, and yeah, there's going to be fish that will haunt your dreams. I don't know if my buddy Phil's on here, Phil D Dignans are, is on here or not, but I know he tells me all the time about this one cobia that haunts his dreams, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's real, but I guarantee what happened there. He may do it again, but I'll bet he won't. Um, and it, you know, it just, it is, it, it's how we become better anglers for sure. So. All right, Tuck. Well, thank you so much for tonight. There's some great, well, great thanks for stuff having me. there. And uh, thank you all for your, for your great questions, except for Dan Frazier. Um, <laughs> stink, uh, stinky, stinky, happy feet Frazier. That's right. That's right. Um, but but thank you all. Thank you all for for hanging in there with us and for asking some really good questions. We really appreciate it. And um, you know, if, if you have more questions, um, you can get hold of Tuck at Bay Street. Um, you know, go to your go to your local Orvis store. Um, they're experienced anglers. Your local Orvis dealer, but your you know or Orvis retail store as well. And um, and they can help you out if you have if you have further questions about this. But saltwater fly fishing is really addictive, and once you do it, you're done. It's all over once you try it. <laughs> yep, yep. I think I sent a I uh, I sent a video to Tom the other day when we were getting this set up, make sure all the electronics was right and all that. And all I all I got back was I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah big so, cobia big cobia right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so all right everyone thanks well, everybody uh, yep thank you everyone and um we'll uh, we'll see you soon